Happy Independence Day to you. If you could take your Bibles and open them to the book of Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 8. I'm going to teach on something uh, this morning as we celebrate this special Independence Day, taking a break from our study in the book of Genesis. I'm going to teach on something this morning that, in all honesty, I wish the Lord had not impressed this on my heart. Because from a human standpoint, there are countless other subjects I'd rather teach on than this. But a word needs to be said about it. The title of our message this morning is The False Gospel of Critical Race Theory. The False Gospel of Critical Race Theory. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul warns us about being seduced by empty philosophies. He says, see to it in Colossians 2 verse 8 that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and according to the elementary principles rather than according to Christ. He warns here about false philosophies seducing Christians. Paul, uh, towards the end of his third missionary journey, made this statement. He says, For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, also from among yourselves. Men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each of you with tears. If the Bible is clear on anything, it's clear on false gospels coming into the church. And I believe that we are looking at a false gospel. This is something very sadly that your children are being taught, your grandchildren are being taught, uh, evangelical church after evangelical church is falling sway to this. It's capturing entire denominations. And it's called something called critical race theory. Has anybody heard of that? Okay. At least I'm talking about something relevant. And this is a big subject to deal with. I'm going to try to deal with it today in these five parts. And I think by the time we finish this, you'll see what it is. It's a substitute Jesus, an imitation Jesus, and a false gospel. Let's start off with the, the target. Who is being targeted? We haven't even defined this yet, but who is being targeted through critical race theory? Why would you bring this up in a church? Don't you understand that this is a political issue and it doesn't concern the church? That's where you're wrong. The church of Jesus Christ has been intentionally targeted with this teaching. Reading a couple of sentences here or there from an article by Trevor Loudon. He says this, at the Southern Baptist National Convention in Birmingham, Alabama in June 2019, a resolution on critical race theory and intersectionality gained passage with a strong majority. The article goes on and describes a man in Southern Baptist circles, and I'm bringing up Southern Baptists as I'll bring up other people, not to attack a particular group or people, but to show you the pervasiveness of this mindset. He brings up in this article a man named Walter Strickland. He says, it is worth noting that a member of the Southern Baptist Convention Resolutions Committee, Walter Strickland, avidly teaches James Cone's theory from his Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in North Carolina to the future pastors that stream through his classroom. 
The article goes on and it says this is not just a Southern Baptist problem. The book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9 is very clear. It says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And I'm going to mention a couple of other names here. And if your personal golden calf happens to get toppled in the process, don't take it personally. Uh, I'm just showing you the pervasiveness of critical race theory. I want to show you that the evangelical church has been intentionally targeted with this doctrine that we're discovering and studying. Some of the best of the best of Christianity are now recycling, regurgitating, I might say, critical race theory. Another news article says this, prominent local pastor and author Max Licato, a gentleman that I happen to agree with on many, many things, got down on his knees on Sunday in San Antonio to beg forgiveness for his and his white ancestors' acts of racism and inaction. Here's uh, something else put out by a ministry that has been a blessing to me, Calvary Chapel. When you critique Calvary Chapel, you have to be very careful because not all Calvary Chapel pastors are on the same page related to this issue. There's a great split happening within the Calvary Chapel movement, but part of that movement today is known as the Calvary Global Network, led by Brian Broderson. And when you go to their website, it says this, under institutional racism. We acknowledge that racism has been an element within American history from the beginning. From the legal enslavement of black Africans to the Jim Crow laws and state-proposed segregation, racism has embedded itself in our institutions. Very important language to understand. Sadly, the church has not been guiltless in this matter. American church history has been tragically marred by many examples of complicity with racist policies of the state followed by the church. Segregated congregations are a historic example of the evil of the presence within the church. You'll notice uh, this expression here, institutional racism. Systemic racism. The argument is being made not that there are individual racists within the United States. Obviously, there are but the structure of the country from its roots is racist. The very institutions of the United States, even to the present day, are racist at its core. This is all the outworking of critical race theory. The website goes on and quotes the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 27, which, or verse 19, I should say, which talks about the need to be swift to hear and slow to speak. The implication here is if you're not open to this type of doctrine and this teaching, you're not following exhortations in the book of James. This is how the Bible is being brought into this whole issue related to critical race theory. If you want to see critical race theory in action, I would encourage you, just for purposes of study, to bring up this YouTube clip. It runs about 50 minutes, and you'll notice on the stage there, you have two white evangelicals, Robert Morris and Matt Crouch, the leader of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, and also on the stage are two black evangelicals, Tony Evans and Kirk Franklin, both of whom are claiming to be victimized by racism within the church. Now, Franklin claims this even though he is an award-winning artist, music artist. Tony Evans claims this even though he is a runaway best-selling author and pastor of a mega church 
But somehow in their minds, America and the church has held them down. Critical race theory. And so what you find is Robert Morris and Paul Crouch in this exchange say, we're not going to say anything. You guys talk to us. We the whites are going to listen to you the blacks because we don't have any right to speak on this issue because what would we know about it? We're white and you're black and we don't have a right to speak and we're just going to hear and sit here and listen to how you have been oppressed in the United States and also in the church. This is all the outworking of critical race theory, whether it's Lakato, Brian Broderson, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, the Southern Baptist Convention. This is all coming right into your doorstep as a Christian. What is critical race theory? Let's see if we can define it now that we've looked about how Christianity has been infiltrated with this. The UCLA School of Public Affairs calls, quote, critical race theory, otherwise known as CRT. CRT recognizes that racism is ingrained in the fa fabric and system of American society. So you'll notice that it's not going after individual racists, which would be justified. It's going after the whole United States. The individual racist need not exist to note that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. This is the analytical lens that CRT uses in examining existing power structures. CRT identifies those power structures that are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which per perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. You need to learn some vocabulary here. One of the vocabulary words is something called intersectionality. What is that? It's all the oppressed groups. All the oppressed groups are linked in this system of thought, whether it be racial minorities, uh, women, gender discrimination and oppression, the same-sex movement claims that, that it's oppressed, despite the fact that, I think it was um, Newsweek and World Report, no, excuse me, USA Today came out with an article demonstrating that homosexuals have a household income of almost double that of their heterosexual counterparts. See, facts don't matter. Even though homosexuals are very wealthy in America, they're claiming to be oppressed. That's why they're part of this intersectionality. Of course, those that work for somebody, Karl Marx called them the proletariat. They're oppressed. And where all of these groups link together is something called intersectionality. And if you are not one of those groups, then shut your mouth because you don't have a right to speak. Uh, this is why Paul Crouch and Robert Morris are absolutely silent in the presence of Kirk Franklin and Tony Evans, because what would you know about it? You're on the right side of the power structure. The rest of us are on the wrong side of the power structure. And in fact, critical race theory says this as they talk about white privilege you, as a white person, are actually racist, but you don't even realize it. So you have to be sub, uh, subjugated, subjected, I should say, to seminars, many of which you're forced to attend or you lose your job, to be convinced that you're actually a racist, even though you don't think you're a racist, and to be convinced that you're living in a country of white supremacy and oppression institutionally. This is what's called critical race theory. It's coming at us from virtually every angle, including Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who made in the United States of America, by the way, millions and millions of dollars shooting that outstanding shot he had, the sky hook, and he said this recently, he said, quote, well, 
It's just like if you have never been in a room and there's something, you feel a little something itching in your nose. There's something in the air, a dust or a pollen, and you can't see it. Racism is like that. It's ingrained in society. It's taken for granted. And all of the things that are taken for granted can accumulate and be deadly on certain segments of the population. And it comes down on the heads of poor people and people of color. It's subconscious whether you realize it or not. This is all a thought process that I'm going to define for you that's extremely well orchestrated in academia called critical race theory. So, you know, the, the Olympics happened, the NBA playoffs and championship happened, and Colin Kaepernick happened, and now it's very common to see athletes who simply will not properly salute the flag. In fact, here's a picture of the Georgetown Hoyas basketball team coached by basketball legend Patrick Ewing and you'll notice that every single one of them is taking a knee and will not participate in the national anthem and will not salute the flag because to them the United States is an oppressive colonial power see critical race theory so if you believe this and you become a critical race theorit theoretician, what's your solution? Well, the solution is you've got to change the power structures. What does that mean? Affirmative action. Hate speech codes. What you can say, what you can't say. Something called the Equality Act, which will take transgender status and elevate it to the right of civil rights minority protection. The big thing they want is reparations. What are reparations? Reparations basically says I'm going to take money from someone who never owned a slave and give it to someone who never was a slave. Because after all, that money was gained through oppression over the course of time. We all know that, critical race theory. And that's basically what you call redistribution of the wealth. And those solutions are actually on the more moderate side. When you get into the radicals, what you discover is they're all about violent revolution. This is the reason when you look back over the tragic death of George Floyd, which was wrong and detestable, we all agree with that, suddenly there came a movement of the burning of the cities, defund the police, and all of these sorts of things because this came from, not from a racist, but from an, a society that inculcates racism. So here's a movement called Revolutionary Abolitions Movement. They've got a few goals here, 10 of them. Liberation will be won by any means necessary, they say. We will destroy the state, the police, the military, and corporations, and all of those who run the American plantation. Why would you call it an American plantation? Because America and the church are institutionally racist, systemically racist from their core. We will live in a world of dignity without prisons. Systems of punishment will be abolished. There will be no law to enforce, no money to protect. Revolutionary justice will be determined by those who are oppressed. See, if you're not oppressed, you have no right to speak. There will be government, there will be no government, no person or group will have power over another. Communities will make decisions about how they live and will make sure that everyone has what they need to live a dignified life. Land is not property, it is alive and communal and must be protected. Alongside institutional racism, alongside institutional comrades, 
international comrades, I should say, we will destroy the borders for the free movement of people everywhere. Is society and its direction starting to make sense to you when you see this playbook? Militant networks will defend our revolutionary communities. Liberation begins where America dies. You've got to destroy the whole power structure and replace it with something new. That's what's called a progressive. You're progressing towards something. But you can't progress towards that something until you destroy what exists. And why does it need to be destroyed? Because it's racist from its core. Now, the point I want to communicate to you is this is being used by an old ideology called Marxism. In fact, who you're looking at there, I think, is probably one of the most influential Marxists that has ever lived. His name is Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci advised World War II dictator Benito Mussolini that violence was not the only way to bring about a lasting revolution. Gramsci eloquently wrote of a quiet revolution or one that would transform culture from within by changing the basic worldview of each and every institution in society. Gramsci talked about, forget winning the next election. What we need is what he called a long march through the institutions. And he talked about how you have to infiltrate the areas of thought, academia, media, news, entertainment, the pulpit, anywhere where there are thought leaders. And you have to get those thought leaders on your side. And you have to alter the worldview of the population. And once the worldview of the population is altered, they may not become full-blown communists, but they're sure sympathetic to Marxist ideas. And this is how to bring in lasting change. One of the great leaders in communism is a man named Saul Alinsky. And he wrote a book on this called Rules for Radicals. He is also the mentor of Hillary Clinton. And by the way, if you own a copy of this and read it, and I would encourage you to read it just to see what they're saying. You open up the dedication page and he dedicates his book to Lucifer. Kind of shows you where he's coming from. He says, lest we forget at least an over-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our uh, legends and mythology and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom. And he dedicates this book to Lucifer. What did Saul Alinsky contribute to Marxism? I told you what Gramsci contributed. What did Alinsky contributed? He said, here's how to do it. You've got to divide a host culture. You've got to get people within a host culture at war with each other. And if you get them fighting with each other, didn't Jesus himself say, any kingdom that is divided against itself is laid waste. And how do you get a culture to be at war with itself? He called this community organizing. One of our presidents not too long ago. Gee, sir, why do you want to be president? Can we look at your resume? What is your resume? I'm a community organizer. Well, this all goes back to Saul Alinsky. And in community organizing, what Alinsky essentially said is you go into a culture and you find an area where there's resentment between the people groups. And you rub it raw, he said. You inflame it. You intentionally antagonize it. 
you intentionally aggravate it. And it won't be long until group A is at war with group B. And if you get group A at war with group B, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and they will be crying out for a substitute. And what's the substitution? Utopia. Marxism. And this is how culture after culture after culture around the world, like clockwork, has been toppled by Marxists. It's a Gramsci, Alinskyite strategy. Marxists like to talk about the gaps, supposedly, between the rich and the poor. They like to talk about the conflict between the worker and the owner. They, Marx classically called it the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie, if I'm pronouncing that right. The problem in the United States, though, is it's a hard sell. You don't have a lot of class tension in the United States like you do in other countries. Because in other countries of the earth, the station that you're born in, you're stuck in all your life. Not so in America. America, you can start at the very bottom and go right to the top with hard work and ingenuity and the opposite could happen. You can start at the top and go right to the bottom through poor choices. So how do you sell class warfare in a country like the United States? You can't, but here's what you can sell in the United States, racial tension. Because America, going back into our past, the civil rights movement, going back into our past, slavery, etc., there is racial tension. There are people that are resentful over the past. And following the Alinsky playbook, you need to find where those areas of tension exist and you need to talk about them over and over again. Don't talk about your freedom and opportunity in the United States and the fact that if you are born in the United States, you are living on the winning lottery ticket that most people around the world could only dream of. Don't talk about that. Talk about how some racial group is holding you down. And you get the culture to be at war with itself. Communists are intentionally using the race issue. That's what critical race theory is. Oh, come on, Andy, you're getting into conspiracy theories. You mean the commies are using the racial issue? Well, I would invite your attention to a man named Manning Johnson who testified in 1953 to this very thing before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, and he actually wrote a 1958 book about it called Color, Communism, and Common Sense. Let me read to you a quote or two, if I can, from the work of Manning Johnson, obviously a black person. Being an idealist, he said, I was sold a bill of goods by a Negro graduate of the Lenin Institute in Moscow. The color of one's skin is no bar to a young man or woman dreaming of making a better world. Like other Negroes, I experienced and I saw many injustices and inequities around me based on color, not ability. I was told that the decadent capitalist is responsible, that mass pressure could force concessions, but that just prolongs the life of capitalism and that I must unite and work with all those who more or less agree that capitalism must go. Little did I realize, it's in his own book and it's his own testimony before Congress. Little did I realize is, is, is that I was deeply enmeshed in the red conspiracy. That just and seeming grievances are exploited to transform idealism into a cold 
and ruthless weapon against the capitalist culture. What he's saying is I was played like a fiddle by Marxists. They knew I was resentful and they exploited my resent and they turned me from being a civil rights activist into a leftist. Manning Johnson says this, after two years of practical training in organizing street demonstrations, inciting mob violence, how to fight the police, and how to politically throw a brick and hide, I was ready in the opinion of my leaders for a top communist school. What did uh, the Apostle Paul say concerning Satan? He said, we are, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, we are not ignorant of his devices. And yet most of evangelicalism, as I'm speaking here, have never heard teaching like this. And when they begin to bow the knee to critical race theory, they have no idea the genie that they're letting out of the bottle. The Marxist utopia. Redistribution of wealth which, by the way, always leads one direction. It leads to enslavement for everyone and hell on earth. There's a reason why Cubans get in rickety rafts and travel shark-infested waters to make the journey from Miami, uh, excuse me, from Havana to Miami with the hope of touching down on American soil. Why would you risk your whole life to do that? Because they're obviously running from something. The last time I checked, those rafts don't go the opposite direction. They go one direction. There's a reason why the world is beating down our doors to the point where it's causing a border crisis to get into the United States. They're obviously fleeing from something. What are they fleeing from? They're fleeing from the utopias that they were promised. The, the identical utopia via critical race theory that is now being taught and promoted by some of evangelicalism's best and brightest. May God help us to understand the time period that we're living in. Number three, the progenitors. Who is teaching this stuff? Critical race theory. Well, one of the leaders you need to know is a man named James Cone. James Cone at Union Theological Seminary. Ah, he used his position as a teacher of theology to future pastors to teach critical race theory. This is not just a political issue. This is a spiritual issue. I put spiritual in quotes. He is the religious revolutionary of critical race theory. And he says, quote, any talk about God that fails to make God's liberation of the oppressed as its starting point is not Christian. What did he just do here? He just changed the Great Commission. The Great Commission is about changing the racist power structures of American society. By the way, his mentor was a man named Jeremiah Wright. You ever heard of that name? Who became the senior pastor of the United Church of Christ in Chicago that our president, Barack Obama, was under for 20 years. He says this. Look at this title here of a contribution he made to a book. The black church and Marxism. What do they have to say to each other? It's not me up here dreaming up conspiracy theories. It's simply me with reading comprehension abilities, reading what he says. He's making the connection. I'm not making the connection. Manning Johnson is making the connection. I'm not making the connection. I'm just reading what they say. In his 1969 book, Black Theology and Black Power, Cone wrote, the time has come for white Americans to be silent. That is exactly what you'll see on that Trinity Broadcasting Network YouTube clip that I mentioned earlier. 
The time has come for white Americans to be silent and to listen to black people. All white people are responsible for white oppression. Theologically, Malcolm X was not far from wrong when he wrote that the white man is the devil. In uh, 2004, in an essay, Cohn opined, quote, black suffering is getting worse, not better. White supremacy is so careful and evasive that we can hardly name it. It claims not to exist, even though black people are dying daily from its poison. Critical race theory. It's all the outworking of it. This, this was so well thought out in academia before it hit our culture. And it was thought out in the seminary. Another man you need to know is Derek Bell, because while James Cone was developing this at the theological level, Derek Bell was developing it at the legal area. I don't know why I see this as clearly as I do. I think it's because I have formal training in both theology and law. I can pick up on this just like that. Derek Bell writes, it appears that my worst fears have been realized. We have made progress in everything, but nothing has changed. America liberated the slave, doesn't matter. America passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, doesn't matter. Because institutional racism is alive and well. So what do we do to fix it? You've got to topple the structures which are racist from their core. By the way, there's a copy of Derek Bell's book circulating in the law schools. There's edition one on the left. It's now in its sixth edition. This is common reading amongst lawyers in the law schools. It's all a critical race theory. And I want to show you this, at least this much, that this is a false gospel. This is not Jesus Christ. This is a different Jesus. It sounds like Jesus. They even quote Bible verses. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible. Does not scripture warn us over and over again against false gospels? Paul warns us about turning to a contrary gospel, Galatians 1. He warns us about a different gospel, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, and you can't have Jesus in bed with communism. You can try to make Jesus a social reformer. You can try to make Jesus talk about gaps between the rich and the poor, which is what critical race theory does. But at the end of the day, it's not who we just celebrated this morning at the Lord's table, it's not the Savior that came into the world to die in our place. It's a different Jesus. As the Southern Baptists in 2019 were moving in this direction, you know, you ask yourself, this is the denomination of Charles Stanley, Adrian Rogers, heroes of the faith. Why doesn't anybody speak up? There's a few. Here's a man named uh, Tom Askell, senior pastor, Grace Baptist Church in Cape Coral, Florida. Critical race theory, he says, and intersectionality are rooted in ideologies that are incompatible with Christianity. Paul told us not to be unequally yoked. Jesus has nothing in common with communism. As much as people try to make Jesus a young communist, socialist, revolutionary. It's a different ecclesiology. What is ecclesiology? Ecclesiology is the doctrine of the church. I mean, does the church have to sit around and contemplate and ruminate and think about racial tension all of the time? I mean, should pulpit after pulpit after pulpit be preoccupied with institutional racism in the United States, altering the structures of society, social justice? Why would I do that as a pastor when Jesus has already fixed the racial issue? A black person, a Hispanic person, an Asian person, a white person at the foot of the cross are all equal. 
because we're saved the same way. You know, we celebrate what Rosa Parks did. You want to see Rosa Parks 2,000 years ago? Look at Jesus. He went and ministered to a half-breed, a Samaritan. To the point where the Samaritan was shocked that he was talking to her. It says in John 4, verse 9, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus says, I do. And it was so powerful that the disciples sat there and stood around and they couldn't believe what he was doing. The the truth of the matter is, if you want to get into the subject of race, we've got the greatest book that's ever been written on the subject. Why not just teach what the Bible says about race rather than linking racial tension with Marxism to topple your own country? Galatians 3 verse 28 says there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Why would it matter the pigmentation of a person's skin if they're an image bearer of God just like me and they're saved the exact same way I am? Ephesians 2 and verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace who has made both groups into one and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. If you want to talk about race, let's talk about what Jesus already did on the topic. Rather than be naively swept into critical race theory, which is Marxism, yet the church has become preoccupied with this and as the church becomes preoccupied with this they are placing into the church a barrier that God didn't put there Trevor Loudon quotes the following in his article he says I was told recently of an episode that occurred in a church in North Carolina the young pastor all fired up with critical race theory noticed that a black family and a white family in his congregation shared the same surname. He falsely concluded that the ancestors of the white family must have once owned the ancestors of the black family. From the pulpit, the pastor demanded that the white family apologize to the black family for their slave-owning sins of their forefathers. The white family bravely refused to apologize for the non-existent transgression which created a major split in the church. That particular church no longer exists. This is what's happening as the church is being seduced by critical race theory. Critical race theory is a world view. We know it's a worldview because it answers all of the questions that Christianity answers. Who am I? The Bible tells you that. A special creation from God. Where did I come from? From God's design. Why am I here? To glorify God. Where am I going? To heaven. How can I get there? Through Jesus Christ. Critical race theory comes along and says we have answers to all those questions too. But we're going to answer the same question differently. Who are we? Not image bearers of God, but you're a member of a group. It's all about group. Uh, The fancy name for this is political identity, special identity. The focus isn't the fact that you are an image bearer of God, but you're in an oppressed group. Critical race theory. What is our problem? We would say our problem is sin. Critical race theory says, no, the problem is oppression. All the talk is about oppression, not the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sins and need Jesus, but you're part of an oppressed group. What is the new birth? The Bible says the new birth is regeneration. Titus 3 verse 5. The impartation of divine life. What is regeneration in critical race theory? It's being woke. 
wokeness. You've got to read all of these books and listen to all of these seminars because you need to be woke. What does that mean? You need to be awakened to the subconscious racist that you already are and you just don't know it. It's a, it's a different um, regeneration. What's the solution? We say the solution is Jesus Christ. Critical race theory says it's liberation through what? Regime change. Regime change. Changing power structures. So the focus is no longer the individual salvation of the soul, but the collective salvation of the nation. You follow that? You can go into woke churches and it's all about collective salvation, not individual salvation. Because they've been infiltrated with critical race theory. What is our duty as Christians? Well, our duty is the Great Commission. Our duty is to pray, as Jim prayed today, that we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. I don't see any regime change here, do you? 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. Get out there and change the structures of society. That's not at all what we're told to do. We're told to submit to authority as long as that authority doesn't contradict what God has called us to do. We are not hell-raising people in the sense of being loud and obnoxious, but we are working within the system the best we can to spread the salt and light of Jesus Christ in the Great Commission. That is not what is being taught in critical race theory. It's about change, transition, regime change, alter power structures through any means possible. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to glorify God. Did you know that's your purpose? Because God in history, whether it's creation or redemption, works in history to glorify himself. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? Great question. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Critical race theory says, no, your purpose is you need to work for liberation. Further proof that critical race theory is another gospel, you have to look no further than the book Divided by Faith, which is making the rounds in Christian academia making the rounds at groups like the Gospel Coalition, etc., runaway bestseller, co-authored, one of them by a professor right here at Rice University named Michael Emerson, another one named Christian Smith. All you got to do is look at some of the stuff Christian Smith has been involved in He's a liberation theologian. You say, well, what is that? It's taking Marxism and putting it in Christian terminology. Jesus is not the savior. Jesus is the social reformer. And in this particular book, Divided by Faith, they blame institutional racism on the doctrine of original sin. Because if you believe in original sin, you're not talking about the collective sin. See that? And so you are actually a racist by teaching these ideas. The book goes on and it even blames Billy Graham for racism because Billy Graham taught premillennialism. What's that? It's the idea that you're not going to have the kingdom until the king comes. You see, that's institutionally racist. Because if you believe that, you're not working to bring in the kingdom here. It is very disheartening as a theology professor to be given a mandatory book by an institution that you're told to read... When that book tells you that the doctrines that you were hired to teach are racist at their core. You want to put a wet blanket over your faculty? Do that. 
As the critical race theory minds work around the clock, how would they look at Sugarland Bible Church? We're perpetuating racism because we're teaching original sin and we're teaching premillennialism. We've got a different gospel here, folks, a different Jesus. You know, it's interesting, you run into certain people like Jane Fonda, for example, who allegedly came to Christ. And then you actually look at what church she was at when she came to Christ, and you learn that it was a woke social justice church. Kirsten Powers, news commentator, allegedly came to Christ. How did you come to Christ? Oh, I came to Christ under Tim Keller in New York, a social justice warrior. And you have to ask yourself at some point, did those two women actually come to Christ? I don't think they came to Christ, personally. And the reason I think that is they came to a Jesus that was different than this Jesus. They came to a Jesus who was a social reformer. They came to a Jesus who reaffirmed their progressive assumptions. That's why they gave it a hearing. But it isn't the true Jesus. Because Jesus, you come to Jesus by faith alone, through grace alone, and you start to walk with him through progressive sanctification, Jesus has absolutely no interest in confirming your bad presuppositions. What Jesus will do is he is a wrecking ball. Or he will tear down your whole worldview and rebuild it in his image. I came to Jesus with all kinds of weird ideas. Theistic evolution, all kinds of things I believed. And I started getting into my walk with the Lord. And I found that Jesus really wasn't interested in my theistic evolution. <laughs> he started to change my mind on things. And so you have these stories of these conversions of people... And you wonder, is this the right Christianity? Or is this the social reformer Jesus that they came to and they liked what they heard because that Jesus appealed to their itching ears? Well, we've done a lot here describing the problem. By the way, have you read John 16, 2 and 3 lately? It says, they will ban you from the synagogue and yet an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering a service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. Your enemy is about to become people that think they're doing God's will. That's what he's saying here. I can't help but think of this, these verses as we talk about critical race theory. So... What is the answer? I don't know if I have an answer other than the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. But at a human level, I never concede when somebody tells me that the United States of America is structurally racist. If you're going to tell me that there are people in America that are racist, yeah, you've got my ear there. But don't tell me that the whole structure is rotten. If you want to tell me that the police officer that killed George Floyd is a racist, yeah, you've got my ear there, but don't tell me that the whole police department is racist. The fact of the matter is there isn't a country on the face of the earth that has done more to atone for the sins of its past than the United States. Examples include the Emancipation Proclamation, the Civil War, the structural change to our own Constitution, which was the 13th to the 15th Amendments, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You mean to tell me that America is structurally racist when you have a black man who became president twice? Doesn't make any sense. And uh, by the way, if you want to have a conversation about countries around the world that are 
structurally racist, still, I can give you some suggestions. Even today, nearly 160 years after America became one of the first nations to abolish slavery, there are still 94 nations that do not have laws criminalizing slavery. This led to the enslavement of 40 million people in the world right now. In a tragic note of irony, Africa has the highest slave rate today, closely followed by Asia, while North America has the lowest. Senator Tim Kaine, former vice presidential candidate, made a statement on the Senate floor that just defies anything that might be considered normal thinking. He says, the United States did not inherit slavery from anyone. We created it. That's critical race theory. The whole focus is the United States when slavery is alive and well around the world, primarily in Islamic countries. This particular writer writes, slavery is not a crime for almost half the world's population. The first answer to critical race theory is to not accept the premise that America is racist at its core. For reasons I've tried to explain, it is not. From the spiritual level, the best cure for racism is to get back to the book. Because the book teaches, Acts 17, verse 26, that he made from one man every nation. Every human being on planet Earth today, regardless of skin color and skin pigmentation, is linked to Adam. So all of us bear God's image. I know, quite frankly, of no book that teaches this other than the Bible. We are all equal in terms of redemption. For God so loved the world. That would include every race, wouldn't it? By the way, in heaven, if you're a racist, you're not going to like heaven. Because Revelation 5 verse 9 talks about people praising the Lord in heaven who were purchased with Christ's blood from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Racism in the Bible? Not so. If you really want to locate racism, find it in Charles Darwin. Because the full title to Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, is or the preservation of the favored races in the struggle for life. Interesting how that subtitle has been clipped from subsequent editions. But go back to 1859 and you'll find it there. What does he mean the favored races? What he's saying there is one race is not as sophisticated as another race because they're under evolved. They're not as high on the evolutionary scale as is the white race. So evolution itself provides the philosophical basis for racism. And yet, Is anybody trying to cancel Charles Darwin? They're trying to cancel Christianity. But Christianity has done more to eradicate the issue of racism than any other single source. And we're being seduced into a Marxism which is not intellectually honest with this history. So in conclusion, we've looked at the target, Christianity. The definition of critical race theory, its progenitors, why we believe it's a false gospel, and the answer. The answer from the human realm, the answer from the spiritual realm as well. The truth of the matter is whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And there's a lot bigger problem that we have than institutional racism or slavery, it's slavery to sin. 
And the one that put us in that condition is the first Adam. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, came into the world to reverse that condition. Which, by the way, he has successfully done through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And his message, which is, for your enslaved condition, don't trust yourselves to fix your problem. Trust me, because I already fixed the problem. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And wouldn't it be spectacular on an Independence Day holiday to enjoy not just political freedom, but spiritual freedom, because you now have trusted in the Savior. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And this is our focus here at Sugarland Bible Church as the Spirit is convicting men and women of their need to trust Christ for salvation. Our exhortation is to follow through with that conviction and in a single step, place your confidence in Jesus. Confidence or trust is another word of saying believe. Believe what Jesus did in your place. That's it. And that's the gospel. It's good news. And it really is the only thing that will set you free. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If it's something that you're struggling with and need some more questions answered, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for this special day. We're grateful also for warnings like this concerning false gospels. But more than that, we're grateful for the true gospel. We have freedom today because of the blood of the patriots. And we have spiritual freedom today because of the blood of your son. Help us to commemorate these things on this special weekend. Bless our fellowship time that follows. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said,